Hello, uh, my talk is about uh, radical women and their contribution to conceptual art or conceptualism between the 1960s and 1980s. Um, the history of conceptual art in Latin America has been a history of resistance and experimentation within the context of a lot of conflict, political, social, uh, during this period of time. But um, this history has been told in a very male way, meaning that men are the ones that have been the protagonists of this history. Um, and one of the reasons is also because conceptual art in many ways is still conceived um, in Cartesian terms as separating the mind and the body. And because women place the body in very profound ways uh, within the conceptual, this created also a sense of illegitimacy in the languages of conceptual art that they were actually proposing. One of the things that I always wonder myself is um, conceptual art, which started around the 1950s or mid 50s in the world, including Latin America, history of art, canonical history of art has been shaped basically fundamentally by men. So it bears a question, if women were not the one upholding the canonical histories, would they not have a specific amount of freedom and also opportunity and also desire to transgress this canonical history from which they were excluded anyway in the first place? And I think it put them in a specific position of political agency and also a purpose in terms of the works that they were actually producing. This paper, uh, I will focus on only a few artists, there isn't a lot of time, and specifically in, the, in three themes, self-representation, political resistance, and feminism. I think it's important to take into account from the very beginning that the notion of um, conceptual art in Latin America is embedded in very profound ways, as particularly also in, in terms of women, not only placing this body as the locus of political and aesthetic enunciation, but to contest authoritarian governments and society, patriarchal system of exclusion and oppression of women, and also a defense of a political and embodied imagination. I will share some slides now. In explaining this notion of um, placing the body in the center, I want to show very few examples before we move on to the three themes that concern this talk. You know, someone like Regina Silveira with Biscoito Arte, where you produce something which appears to be domestic, the notion of art, and you actually ingest it. So there isn't a fear of, of actually tackling with this notion of the way that women have been actually coupled with you know, the ideas of domesticity and uh, in a limited in a limited way. Or for example, Lenora de Barros um, producing this work when she was trying to actually conceptualize and understand the moment where poetic language actually occurs and how it happens and creating this sort of form of um, kind of almost sexualized uh, way of fertilizing the the keynotes of the of the typewriter's machine, Cecilia Vicuña, Censurado, thinking of the body as a place of enormous epistemological poetic um, agency, where poetry can be completely performative. Or, for example, Ana Maria Maiolino conceptualizing with the mental maps the different ways in which our way of thinking and creating a sense of personal identity is shaped by our histories and personal relationships. Or in Photo Poema Sao, um, embodying the idea of political oppression during the dictatorship in Brazil. Or for example, Ana Mendieta with glass and body imprints, these performative works where she defies uh, the way that you know the body is uh, constructed and gazed by um, by the world as a female body 
Vera Chavez Barcelos creating this epidermis scape made with uh, prints, body prints, and also photographs into converting the skins of a collective body, different parts without judgment, without categorization, such as a nipple of pubic hair, into these uh, giant uh, epidermis caves, which also contravenes the idea of a, of a grid, um, and also a landscape that could embody and include anybody, all the bodies, as opposed to being always about the eye. Olivia Clark, um, here in the I and the you, the idea of uh, perception, you know, in the sense is the eyes, a dominant way is a colonial way of also looking at the world and judging the world and by occluding the, the vision and allowing the other person to explore someone else's body. It allows a sensorial experience that creates a different notion of, um, of gender and of the self and the limitless of the self into the other. So now I would like to begin exploring the notion of self-representation. This is Teresa Burga, a Peruvian artist born in 1935, still alive, that created this piece during the time of the uh, dictatorship in, in Peru. And the interesting thing about this is that self-representation is a particularly complicated notion because women throughout history were mostly represented and objectified through, through the different periods of, of art. And in many ways, um, this notion of a possibility of experimenting with agency has been, was denied to women for many, 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 for many years. And uh, partly also was understood that if women were actually turning the gaze on themselves, it was an narcissistic um, exercise as opposed to something that could be political in the way that you can explore your subjectivity, your mind, and the way you see yourself in the world from embodying your persona. So Teresa Burga, in this case, uses the languages of, of science, for example, electrocardiograms, typology photography, phonocardiograms, other types of medical records, taken over the course of 6th of September 72, in order to actually display, uh, you can see it here in the space, it's different configurations. Uh, these are all contemporary and, and not necessarily ideal. Uh, where the whole self is completely um, exposed in terms of its physiological function, providing us an enormous amount of information in a way dissecting her body from her mind, the way she looks from all the different constituencies of her body. And, and But at the same time, showing how science, in the same way that society tries to control us by classifying us, and determining who we are in terms of our typologies and who we are as gender, it does actually not show anything about the true subjectivity and the mind and the political outreach of who she is. So this is a, a piece which uses science to declassify itself as opposed to classify herself. And one of the interesting things in the center and middle slide is a neon that actually is a sound piece which flickers through the pulse of a heartbeat. And this pulsating heartbeat creates an enormous tension in the piece because at the same time that you have this implosion of the body, you have this unifying powerful sense of this rhythm of the heart that uncontroll uncontrollably overflows with life and itself into the space. Sandriano Mejia is a Colombian artist that um, was born in 1951 and created in 1976 this piece by doing a performance where she would have an EEG, a neurofeedback um, feedback machine, reading in a public event the brain activity in real time. Sandriano Mejia had actually done some um, work to control the state of mind, had actually practiced so that the brain activity, as opposed to how normally women are conceived as uncontrollably hysteric and over-emotional, uh, was actually a portrait of a way of actually her 
um, change in the way that the mind actually is displayed in space with this, uh, you can see these different uh, kind of physiograms uh, as they show as they were coming out of the out of the out of the machine. So instead of so she's using a, ment, a medical mental disease diagnosis machine in actually to embody this making visible the freedom and mental power of her mind. So this is also a piece where the artist is trying to find a way to not portray herself in a traditional way that would actually create the typical pitfall of women being categorized in specific ways. Maria Orenzas, Inez Argentine, an artist born in 1936. This is a piece which illustrates, you know, with these arrows which e expand beyond the head with the word limitada, limited, but at the same time, you have this gaze that confronts us that show how she's defined this label that has been applied to herself specifically for being a woman. This is a very interesting piece called To Think is a Revolutionary Act. Uh, regretfully, the, the slide is not that great, but this is a piece that has a lot of information in it, despite of the fact of being so minimalistic. She places text as the center of the piece. And um, there are different elements like these different arrows and different dots inside the piece that creates this kind of sense of tension in this kind of surface, which is mostly untouched. The only thing that it has this kind of bluish intervention, which seems to be like a, a form of a, of a sky, sort of give um, a sense of infinite possibility. There are also equal signs, which again, are not present in the slides. Apologies for the bad slides. Um, so using language and using signs in a minimalistic composition, it suggested a political potentiality of thinking without prescribing what it is, but also affirming that to think, to truly to think and thinking politically is a revolutionary act. Margarita Paxa is an artist, an Argent, artist born in Argentina in 32, that regretfully left us last year in 2020. She produced um, this series of works like Toma de Batallon from 1975, which she will map um, not only sites of guerrilla resistance, but also highlighting issues such as hunger, violence, and freedom, and different issues. So there is a lo localization through the use of map and word and text of this sort of sense of heightened um, tension with the reality. Um, and, I wanted to focus a little bit more on this piece called Silencio, Silence from 1967. There are different explanations of this piece. Margarita Paxa was extremely brilliant and conceptual in the way she conceived and wrote uh, about her, her work. But for me, this piece also been called Silence, uh, where it was done. It's about life during time of dictatorship. It's kind of a is a cube that not only is a ground zero of the notion of communication and signification when freedom and speech, you know, as actions were negated. So there is a voice and silence inscribed in the transparency of the cube that underscores, is underscored when you exhibit it in a museum or graphical space, creating another layer of meaning, the emptiness and neutrality of the white cube of the museum. So it's a conceptual world that is unrestricted that can be inhabited by the viewer uh, exercise in a production of meaning, knowing that there is a dialectical interplay between the knowledge of the oppressive historic silence in which it was produced and the presence of a separate context in our own condition as contemporary beings. So or a piece like Graciela Carnaval, an Argentinian artist, uh, this is a piece from 1968, where she invited um, to an opening, a group of people, and then the gallery was empty and after everybody was inside, locked them in and then left. So eventually someone came and threw a stone and broke the door, but it was a way of actually uh, exemplifying and, and creating an experience what it actually meant at the time to be living in a society that was actually a repressive society, even though you don't experience it necessarily. Lottie Rosenfeld is another Chilean artist born in 1943. Again, 
another artist that sadly passed away last year. She produced this piece called Una Milla de Cruces sobre el Pavimento, A Mile of Crosses on the Pavement from 1979, a piece that she continued to produce in different contexts over the year. This was particularly made in the Mahenka Street on the eastern edge side of Santiago, where she's reclaiming the public space by subverting uh, a regular code into the symbol of a cross, which becomes an unsubbated, unsubbating, unsubordinated sign denoting both death and the potentiality of transgression and descent. Oluz Donoso, another Chilean artist born in 1921 and died in 2008. She was primarily a print maker. She didn't believe in painting because she considered it as a bourgeois commodity. She produced this work called Winchas in Finn in 1978 that grew over time to include different types of information. And is a piece that was meant to be shown in public, spa public spaces. So for this, she created these uh, photocopies of photocopies of photograph and you know that she would amplify the faces of these people during the regime and reproducing them and joining them in an endless scroll, scroll that would actually overflow let's say from a public building onto the street. Paulina Varas who was, was a friend of Luz Donoso and a scholar that has actually explored her work in an important way described the piece as a living class, declassified archive a sort of incomplete and unresolved memory that when activated as public intervention, it becomes an act of denunciation and content. Another artist that was um, very political, and um, during the time of the, this is uh, Maria Vela Marmoleja was born in 1958 in Colombia and still alive. During the armed conflict in Colombia, produced this work on the, on the, on the left uh, which actually talks about denouncing the violation, the tortures done by the army in Colombia to women, to peasants, to housewives and to students uh, that were protesting against the government in that time in Colombia. So what she did is she uh, did tie together um, hygiene pads, some of them bloodied in a, in a string. And this was actually presented as a work for her sculpture uh, um, exam in, in Colombia and it, it did not pass. So she actually had to leave the school. And moving into that, Marivelle has actually dealt not only with political oppression, eco ecological issues, but also with uh, women's rights. And, and in this particular case, this is a piece called Sesquile. The only thing that remains is this photograph where she actually created the notion of recording the birth as one of the most creative acts that women can actually do. If men are supposed to, and God is male and creator of the world, then she would create life. Therefore, is the greatest act of creation that someone could possibly have, contesting the idea that normally women are considered to be lesser and partly because of the maternity of, for example, Lea Lubin, a very important conceptual artist from, the, um, from Argentina, who also uh, is from 1929, died in 1999, that in uh, 1968, during the uprising in Paris, she took her son, Nicolas, uh, to the museum and actually did the private task, daily task of motherhood in a public space, turning the domestic into political and conceptual gesture, turning into political. So she reclaimed motherhood both as a viable subject of contemporary art, but also as in an important labor and legitimized maternity as something that would not impede women to be artists. The issue is that really maternity is an important aspect that from really early on as it has been assigned as one of the biggest roles of women have as actually an obstacle for being created. Of course, Lea Lublin continues to do important works and thousands of women you know, produce art and also while being mothers and also focusing on motherhoodness. Um, Maris Bustamante, so feminism is a particularly complicated issue for conceptual art and for art in general, because it's often been considered to be like not 
so there is a resistance not only to the notion of feminism, but there is a further resistance to the notion that feminists can be art or can be conceptual. Whereas, you know, I would argue in the works that exist, that is an important form of political imagination, this uh, disobedience and activism. Women in Latin America, they were often participating actively against oppression in political regimes and in left wing, where either militants in left wings or sympathizers, they had to contend with the fact that the left, which was profoundly patriarchal, always considered that women's issues were secondary in importance and the feminist was actually imperialistic. In Mexico, there were important artists. In these particular cases, Maris Bustamante that created this piece called uh, Instrumento de Trabajo, work tool to get rid of machismo, of Freud's machismo, where she actually brings to life the fact that, you know, Freud would say that, you know, women have envious penis, penis uh, and, um, or penis envy, <laughs> sorry. Um, and in this particular case, she also created masks for people to wear them and also, in a way, sort of criticizes by saying that it's an instrument of work, the idea that you have to be a man in a patriarchal society to be of any standing. And then also it uses humor as a transgressive tool. Or someone like Monica Mayer, one of the interesting things about a lot of feminist art in Latin America before and today is that it deals in, in very interesting ways, critical way with humor, uh, with issues of sexual taboos. And in this particular one, Lo Normal, Quiero Ser El Amor, uh, The Normal, I Want to Make Love from 1978, she creates these kind of postcards where she presents her face in different guises, uh, describing that she wants to make love and underneath she stands with home, you know, with my father, with an animal that I've been paid, with a rapist, with myself, with a woman. There are many of them that are more than the one I'm showing here. But the issue with this is that she actually um, has instructions for you to participate in the piece. And she says, read carefully the question carefully and circle the expression that best represents your reaction. Are the results on the 10 cards and subtract the day of the month you were born. If the result is less than 10, congratulations, you are normal. So this is a controversial work because the artist herself embodies and attaches herself with humor to sexual fantasy that cannot be spoken and involves as a spectator to ask questions that interpolate us, leading us to ask ourselves what our own notions of normality. So the last piece of my presentation is Antonieta Sosa, conceptual artist from Venezuela, who was born in 1940 in the US, but lived her life in Venezuela and still alive. She created a piece which couldn't be defined entirely, you know, or classically in inverted comma as a feminist piece, but embodies a lot of the notions that I've actually been discussing in this presentation. She created the term the anto, which you can actually see here in the representation, representation of the feet on the left hand side and the height that she measures with the stick to her head, uh, which she applied uh, throughout the years after the 1970s, up to the 90s in the creation of stairs, slides, chairs, even involving in the 1990s to the creation of a house. Uh, with the measurement of the body. She explains herself in an interview. It's an imaginary line that passes through the center of my body. The idea is to measure the world with a female body with my own body. I suspect the measurement were invented by men and that behind them lurks a manipulation of power. I seek to create my own measurement that is feminine and to remove myself from systems of power. So she used this measurement in a very imaginative way, again, moving away from the notion of the narcissistic, which is normally the suspicious label in which sort of we think of women when we turn the gaze towards themselves, is that also she created pieces like Atrabete Misia, which is a performance where she uh, interacts with these chairs in very, very imaginative way. And these chairs were created all under the notion of the anto and with, uh, very interesting notion of the, the chair as a sculptoric um, as a sculptoric element. So um, the examples I have discussed in this paper are only few of the hundreds of unique and important conceptual works by women artists involving political resistance, 
activism, gender and emancipation, radical imagination and experimentation. There are lots of themes such as technology, ecology, the media, sexuality, language that deserve attention and should be explored. Women were and continue to be today key pioneers of conceptual art in Latin America and the rest of the world. Thank you.